Hello, everyone. Welcome. As we let everyone enter and get situated, please feel free to write in the chat box where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear. And if you're joining us from Facebook, go ahead and comment below where you're tuning in from. And enjoy the jams. We have Linda from Detroit. Welcome. John from Iowa. Great to see you. Kim from Arizona. I'm envious of you. I'm craving warm weather. Kristen from Thousand Oaks, California. Pat from Texas. We have Marty from Pittsburgh. Welcome. Another from Texas, Jill. Hello. Oh, and we have Linda from Ontario, Canada. Welcome. We have Patricia from Las Vegas. Love that. Carol from Virginia. Lots of Texas representation today. I've seen about 10 come in. Mary from North Carolina. Jules from Texas again. Judy from Virginia. Oh, we have Marilyn from DC. Hello. Okay. Oh, Liz is watching from Sweet Home Alabama. I love that movie. <laughs> Stephanie from Louisiana. Welcome. And if we have anybody on Facebook, go ahead and comment uh, below where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, we have someone from Ohio. Jennifer, welcome. Lynn from the villages in Florida, 82 degrees. Oh, so envious. Melody from Ontario. Pam, she says from old Kentucky home. Teresa from San Francisco, hello to the West Coast. Marianne from Southern California. Kathy from Florida. We have Margaret from Washington. Marissa from which city, USA? Denise from Palm Springs. We have people from all over. Welcome, you guys. This is so exciting. All right, so I think we are gonna get started here, everybody. So good afternoon and good morning to those tuning in from the West Coast. My name is Bailey. I work on our community and engagement team and I'm really excited to be here with you today. If this is your first time joining us for a travel talk, welcome, we're happy to have you here. And if you're a returning guest, welcome back. I'm just as happy to have you here. <laughs> Before we get started, I want to set some expectations for this session. First and foremost, your camera and audio are not on, so the host can't see or hear you. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit those via the Q&A function below. Um, and we will have a live Q&A session later at the end of the presentation to answer as many questions as we can. But for those that we can't get to, no problem, we'll have someone reach out following the webinar. Throughout, there will be some fun questions and polls. Um, they should appear and initiate on your screen, but if not, go ahead and click the poll button below. And if you're tuning in from Facebook, uh, the polls will also be on the slide. So we'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and comment below. So without further ado, we're thrilled to be here today to talk about small group tours. We have two incredible speakers joining us for a second time. So not only did they love talking with you all so much that they came back for another travel talk, but they've worked so hard on this new travel style and they have some really exciting things to share today. Go Ahead Tours is known as a leader in the group travel industry, and our right size advantage is truly what sets us apart. We design our group sizes depending on the tour and the experiences offered. So our standard tours range from 15 to 38 travelers, but again, this depends on the tour. And we've heard from our travelers and we understand that now more than ever, smaller group travel is something many will be looking for. So with this, our teams have uh, curated an incredible list of itineraries for all different travel styles, and we wanna share that with you today. We'll be highlighting the benefits of traveling in a small group, the different ways that you can travel, and some exciting experiences and destinations that you can go to. 
So with that, I would love to introduce our two hosts. First, we have David Evans. He's our Senior Vice President of Land Operations. David's been with EF for 20 years, and he's based out of our world headquarters in Zurich. Having worked for multiple departments in the company, from sales, from finance to working on the tour director team, he is a jack of all trades. So David, would you introduce yourself? Certainly, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I say good evening, because I'm joining you from, uh, from Europe. Um, I'm actually based in our headquarters in Zurich in Switzerland. And if you can see behind me, this is the actual uh, the lobby of our office here in Zurich. Um, so I work with teams uh, both in Zurich, where we have our operations teams that put together the itineraries for all of the tours that we have. But I also am responsible for tours uh, for operations worldwide. And so I work with our teams that are located all over the world. As Bailey said, I've been with EF for 20 years in total. Um, and I'm really passionate about travel, um, about understanding new cultures, meeting new people. But for me, the number one thing about travel is trying new food. Um, but it's really these, uh, these uh, passions that have really driven my career uh, in travel over the last 20 years. Awesome. I love trying new food too. <laughs> Thanks, David. So second, we have Leo Cassis. He's our Vice President of Market Innovation and Development. Lael has been with EF for over 14 years and he's based in our Boston office. Having traveled to 75 different countries, he brings his knowledge and expertise to life when collaborating and designing each of our itineraries. So Lael, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hello everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lael Cassis and I'm the Vice President of the Market Innovation and Development Team here at EF Go Ahead Tours. I've always had a passion for travel. Uh, for me, the world is an infinitely interesting place. I'm always trying to learn and build my expertise. This has become a lifelong pursuit of knowledge for me. For me, travel is not just about visiting a destination or learning about its culture, food, history, and geography. It's also about meeting amazing people, both fellow travelers like yourselves, but also locals along the way. My team is always on the lookout for interesting and immersive experiences that help shape your travel experience. Our goal is to offer itineraries that will give you a sense of awe and provide a deeper understanding of the world. And of course, that are also fun and joyful. We're here today to talk about our small group tours, and I'm really excited about these. In a recent industry survey, 64% of respondents in the US rated authentic and local experiences the most important priority when planning a trip. This was higher than any other category. As an industry leader in experiential travel, EF Go Ahead Tours continues to deliver meaningful, culturally enriching travel for those seeking authentic and local experiences. We strive to be the safest, easiest, and most meaningful way to travel. With 190 plus itineraries, we have a diversity of travel style and destination options for all travelers like yourselves. It's all about finding the right trip for you. To provide more options to our travelers and address the varied travel passions for our customers, we're now offering a collection of small group tours with group sizes of 10 to 22 travelers. Although important and a differentiator, these tours are not, are not just about smaller group sizes. Our small group tours get you more off the beaten path to secondary cities and to countryside destinations. This collection of tours offers active travel experiences that connects you with the local communities and makes a positive impact on the world. Our small group tours are organized around three major travel styles which are food and wine tours, safari and wildlife tours, and adventure tours. We'll get into each of these travel styles more in detail later in the webinar. So let's talk about some of the major benefits of traveling in a small group with Go Ahead Tours. Our small group tours allow travelers to dive deeper into a destination. They allow you to build deeper connections to each other with your tour director and local guides, but also to the communities um, that we visit. These tours allow more immersive and exclusive experiences that can only be done with small group sizes. Also, have you ever tried to plan a trip on your own? It can be exciting, but it's also a ton of work and requires a lot of research. I know this firsthand because this is what I do every day. This gets even harder when traveling to uh, far flung destinations or when focusing in on a specific theme like food and wine or safari or adventure experiences. Well, our small group tours allow you to see and do more than you would by yourself. With our worldwide network and deep expertise, we provide you with safety, security, and support to go explore far corners of the globe. 
Lael, so I'm just going to stop you quickly. We actually had a question that was submitted from Margaret. She wants to know, what is the smallest group allowed? Uh, that's a great question. And hi, Margaret. I believe we've met um, some, some time in the past. So as I mentioned, our small group tours, um, you know, really start with at 10 customers. So they'll run anywhere from 10 to 22 customers, but a few specific itineraries, uh, especially some of our safaris, or actually be can can run even smaller and really dependent on safari vehicles. It can run even with six or seven customers. Um, also, you know, if you you're interested in actually privatizing a tour um, or customizing an experience uh, to meet your needs, you know that can be done starting with seven travelers. Great, thank you for clarifying, Lau. Um, now I want to hand it over to David. He's going to talk us through if a small group tour is right for you. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bailey. So when it um, when we want to look at the experiences on our small group tours, um, let's start by looking a little bit at the sightseeings. Um, and when it comes to sightseeings, our guides and tour directors um, on any go ahead tour experience are able to connect you with the destinations in really unique ways. But as a smaller group, you actually have an opportunity to head a little bit more off the beaten track. So I'm talking about really stepping into that that courtyard that perhaps only the local people know. Um, or walking along that alleyway that takes you into the local community. Um, so it's a really, it's a really great, great chance to interact with the local environment. Um, there is also uh, the opportunity, for example, to, to step into the guide or tour director's you know, favorite bakery and, and, and sample one of the pastries that they loved and always had when, when they were growing up, um, for example. Um, there's a little bit more emphasis, I would say, on our small group tours in terms of um, getting off the bus. There's a little bit more walking as well. Um, but really, you know, by, by walking and getting off the bus, that's when the special moments happen and, and these incredible travel memories are formed. In terms of local interactions as well, I mean, that's so important, meeting local people. And on all of our small group tours, you have the opportunity to interact with, with locals. So whether that's chatting with um, a, uh, a farming family on, on, a, on a farm experience, in Ireland, or whether that's one of our home hosted dinners, sitting at a table with a family, um, talking uh, about what goes on and, and their daily routines and really getting to know how people live in that country. Um, it's a great opportunity. In terms of tastings and foods, and I mentioned earlier, you know, food is, is definitely uh, a favorite for me. Um, tastings are super important on all of our tours too. And in most of our guided sightseeing tours, we include tastings not just to ensure we've got the energy that we need to go on our, our sightseeing tour, but also by sampling those local delicacies, you, re you really learn so much about um, the local people um, and the tradition and the culture. Um, but for me, the most important place to go when visiting any city is the marketplace, because it's there that you really see the, the sights, the smells, the, the noises, um, and you see people going about their daily lives as well. Um, and, uh, and for me, whenever I head to, to a city, uh, whenever I'm traveling, the first place I always go to is, uh, is the marketplace. When it comes to meals as well, meals are very important on our tours too. Um, we really prioritize locally owned restaurants over say restaurants and hotels. And we always try and, uh, include options, um, to try the local specialities as well. Hands-on activities feature highly too. So we're talking things about things like cooking lessons, uh, where you can learn how to cook the local dishes, but of course, always tasting them afterwards, which is definitely the most fun part, um, to trying your hand at say weaving in a, a local community in Peru, um, to planting trees in a reforestation project in Costa Rica. So our tours are really all about, you know, hands-on and getting involved. And some of the experiences are we would describe as active travel experiences as well. So whether this is going on a hike um, on the Sleeve League on the west coast of Ireland, uh, which is cliffs that that uh, about 600 feet above sea level and offer incredible views of the Atlantic Ocean, or whether it's uh, having a light bike ride around the medieval city walls of an, of an Italian city. Um, there are so many opportunities for active travel on our tours. Um, but we also cater for those people who are looking for something with a slightly slower pace as well. Um, so we have a series of health and wellness inspired experiences too, um, such as spa experiences and, uh, and yoga retreats too. However, um, I think where you travel uh, is, uh, is just as important as how you travel. 
And so how we travel on our small group tours is really important as well. Um, and we have the opportunity to travel in lots of different ways, whether that's a four by four on a safari or a game drive, or whether that's traveling on a, a train through the Alps, um, or whether it's getting onto small boats and, and, and discovering these sort of inner tributaries of rivers to get really close up to, uh, to wildlife and to nature. Um, travel is a big part of the way we experience um, on our small group tours. Wow, thank you, David. That all sounds amazing. When you were talking about joining a local family for dinner, sounds incredible. And planting trees at a reforestation, reforestation project in Costa Rica, that really shows that traveling smaller gives you a more intimate hands-on experience, which I think a lot of people are looking for. So now that we're all dreaming of travel, I wanna take it one step further. Well, can you tell us more about the different travel styles that you get on a small group tour? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bailey. Uh, so we'll start with our food and wine tours. Um, so from cooking alongside a local chef to tasting a world-class wine right at the vineyard where it's made, the, our small group food and wine tours are often a customer favorite. These trips introduce you to your destination and its culture through cuisine. Along the way, you'll learn about sustainable food production and meet local partners who promote the preservation of culinary traditions. Our food and wine tours give you an in-depth look at some of the most incredible food and drink regions of the world. This includes hidden gems like Bordeaux, France, known for its bold red wines, or Alentejo, Portugal, known for its incredible olive oil, or Emilia Romano in Northern Italy, which some say it's the best food region in all of Italy, but a lot, a lot, uh, a lot of people argue otherwise. <laughs> I'm gonna hand it over to David, who is gonna talk about a few experiences that, that make this travel style so special. Thanks, Lael. Um, so I wanted to start by actually transporting everybody to Greece, to the island of Crete. Um, and about 30 minutes outside the capital Heraklion is the town or the village of Arcanis. And now Arcanis has a population of 4,000 people, but it's one of the most stunning villages in the whole of Crete. Um, so it's surrounded by lush vineyards, by olive groves and cypress trees. And you can see here in the picture, it's absolutely stunning. There's flowers everywhere, these beautiful painted buildings as well. And you'll have the opportunity to try uh, a Greek coffee, of course, um, but also sample some of the Arcanis uh, wine, which the region is famous for as well. Another highlight of this visit is a visit we have to a women's cooperative um, in Arcanis. And, um, here you can see one of our groups with the Cretan women learning how they make the local uh, delicacies that they bake, um, all made from local ingredients. And in fact, people travel from all over Europe to join these ladies um, to cater for uh, weddings and baptisms and, and, and name days. Um, but whilst we're there, we get to learn how they make it. We get to sample uh, the local tea, which I think is pronounced as distamnus tea, um, and then sample the pastries and the pies and, and so on. Um, but it's really just a great example of our small group tour experiences that we offer. Meeting local people, tasting food, learning how those foods are made, but also supporting the local community through our visits as well. Um, moving on to Italy, um, to this cooking lesson in Bologna, in the region of Bologna. Um, and this is Federica, who you can see in the photo, who runs this cooking class for us. She is the third generation of this family who have farmed this particular land. Um, and it's a uh, completely women's uh, women led um, organization and they focus on sustainable agriculture. Uh, the farm to table concept is something that they really support as well. Um, and they support their local community, too. So um, they employ local people who are looking to get back on their feet uh, by offering them employment on the farm. Uh, and they've been awarded the, the slow food status as well since 2018. So in terms of the cooking lesson, um, the, it's Bolognese gastronomy, obviously we're, we're close to Bologna, um, and the pasta in that region is the egg pasta, and particularly tortellini and tagliatelle. And Federico actually told us that, uh, interesting fact about the, uh, the tagliatelle, so as you know, tagliatelle is like strands of sort of strands of hair. It was actually named after a, a lady called Lucrezia Borgia. Now Borgia, of course, is a very famous name in Italy, as we all know. Um, but it was named after her when she married the Duke of Ferrara. So fun fact there. Um, but overall, this experience is, is incredible. And our customers, our travelers just rave about the experience with Federica. And what they really talk about a lot is the fact that the food that they're cooking with, all the food they're cooking with in the cooking lesson has traveled zero miles, um, which is amazing to think that the food is coming all from the farm. 
Well, now I'm craving pasta. So thank you, David. <laughs> Before we jump into some exciting new itineraries, I do wanna test the group to see if we have any sommeliers in here. Uh, so that poll question should pop up for you on your screen. And for those that are tuning in from Facebook, just go ahead and answer in the comments below. So do you know when grapes are typically harvested in Italy? Is it mid to late August, September 1st, always, late September to mid-October, or early June? Let's hear, let's see if we have any grape experts here. Okay, so it looks like the majority is saying late September to mid-October. Let's see. Just a few more seconds. Awesome. So you are correct. 79, or I'm sorry, 70% of you said that the correct answer, which is late September to mid-October. Um, love to see those grape experts here. So Lael, can you tell us a little bit more about tours where they can learn about grape harvesting? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in addition to the amazing food and wine tours we already offer in countries like Italy, Greece, and Portugal, I'm excited to announce that we're launching four new food and wine tours this week and next. So let's get into the two examples of these new tours. Um, I'll start with our food and wine tour of Campania, Puglia, and the Amalfi Coast. For anyone who hasn't been, uh, Puglia is often an overlooked region of Italy and should be on everyone's travel list. This area of Southern Italy is known for its miles of Mediterranean coastline along the Adriatic, centuries old farmland and beautiful little villages. It's also an incredible, uh, chock full of incredible wine regions producing some of the best primitivo wines in Italy. Puglia is also a region that produces over 40% of all Italian olive oil and has ancient olive groves that meander down to the sea. This tour combines Puglia with well-known Naples and Campania, home of Neapolitan pizza, as well as the scenic Amalfi Coast. One of my favorite days on this new tour takes you to a little village of El Burro Bello in the Tria Valley for a walking food tour where you also visit one of the famous cone-shaped uh, truly houses. Then that evening, you learn how to make classic Pugliese food at a cooking class at a local masseria. It's a really incredible day. The second new itinerary I wanna highlight is our Ireland, a feast of culinary flavors and local traditions. Ireland doesn't always come to mind uh, for many when you think about food or culinary destinations, but Ireland has really reinvented itself and has balanced its incredibly rich agricultural heritage with a new movement of innovative craft and local excellence. Ireland now is some of the best quality food producers anywhere in the world, and you'll get to meet the incredible Irish people behind this movement on our tour. You'll love this itinerary. It's not just about beer or whiskey. It's also about learning how to make Irish cheese or visiting a farmer's market in West Cork, or meeting farmers and making jam alongside them, um, overlooking you know, the beautiful sea. This tour has so much to offer. Thanks, Lael. I too am also very excited about this uh, tour, um, but particularly because this evening we're actually joined, or I say this evening because I'm in Europe, uh, but today we're actually joined by one of our hosts from, uh, from Ireland. Um, and so in a moment, I will hand over to John Fitzgerald um, to introduce himself. But before I do that, um, whilst we're chatting with John and learning a little bit more about the experience that John uh, runs in Ireland, if you have any questions about what we're talking about, please do post them in the comments. And at the end, we hope to have uh, a little bit of time to, uh, to talk to John. So. Uh, John, I'm going to pass over to you. Um, very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Please introduce yourself. Good, um, good evening, folks from um, South Kerry um, on the coast of Ireland. Um, my name is John Fitzgerald. Delighted to be joining you. I hope you're all doing, minding each other in these trying times. Um, for over a decade now, myself and my wife, Carrie Ann, have been taking visitors down to the shoreline when, locally here and showing them the abundant um, seaweeds that uh, thrive in our pristine waters. Um, so you get to walk along the coast um, the coastline, and you get to cut seaweeds raw off the rocks, and you get to taste various different ones. Um, you, all of them have different mouthfeels, different tastes, um, and all sorts of different properties. So you get to learn the history of seaweed use, um, how they were eaten by the original settlers some 10,000 years ago, um, and what they're used for right up into the present day. 
um, from a culinary point of view, and also there are many, many health benefits. That's great, John. I think we have um, we have a video as well that um, we just want to play, and maybe you can just talk us through this video a little bit. Sure. This is this is where um, we conduct our tours in the magnificent and historical Derrynan Harbour. They're the Skellig um, rocks uh, in the distance. The larger one, Skellig Michael, was occupied by the monks from the sixth to the twelfth century. It was then the edge of the known world, some tw twelve kilometers off the coast of Ireland. So next stop um, was basically, as we know back then, the world was flat. So the next next stop was you fell off the, the side of the earth and you were gone into the abyss. But the monks lived out there for six centuries um, and seaweed formed a part of their diet, an essential part of their diet. If you like, it's, it's not just a vegetable garden, but it's also their health food store because all seaweeds are packed with vitamins, minerals, trace elements, um, omega-3, omega-6 oils. Um, they're packed with plant sterols. They've got proteins and carbohydrates and fiber. So they they literally are a superfood. They've got more antioxidants um, than goji berries. Um, they're, that, that particular one there, nari or slaukon, is up to 37% protein. So if you would think about that, that's um, chickpeas are 28%. So 37% protein is, is a massive amount. Um, this this, this uh, was where the, the earliest settlers in Ireland ten, some 10,000 years ago, they lived by the coast because there was abundance of the food. Their paleo diet, if you like, was shellfish and seaweed. That's what they ate every day. You pay a hundred bucks for your lunch in LA or London. They said no every single day and they're super healthy. They had so the country was covered in forest, which you know from our fair tales if you go down to the woods, it never ends good. These are um, some seaweed um, handled cutlery. And um, one of our inventions, we use the kelp rods that blow up after the southerly storms and we put them onto vintage um, pieces of cutlery. We supplied, uh, our first customer was a restaurant in a famous restaurant now in Ireland called I'm sure, which is the Irish word for uh, weather. And the head chef there, Jordan Bailey, he was the first guy in over a hundred years to win two Michelin stars within six months of opening his doors. And um, so he's, he's a, what Ireland's top restaurant and they use our cut or kelp cutlery um, um, in their, in, in, as part of their offering. Yeah, that's super interesting, John. Um, I heard you mentioned when we were looking at some of the seaweed there, I heard you mention nori, which I'm familiar with from, from sushi. Um, yeah, sushi wrap one. Um, yeah, but some of the other ones I don't think I'd heard of. Can you tell us a little bit more about the types of seaweed that we would see um, on this experience? Sure. Um, I think we've got a slide there. The, one of one of my favorites is Dillisk, the one in the in the center there. Palmaria palmata is the Latin name. It's it's um, it comes from two Irish words, dulishka, meaning the leaf of the water, um, and this has been eaten in Ireland forever. It was hugely important historically because the monks on Skelligs, they would have harvested this at low tide and then stored it. Because it lives between the high water mark and the low water mark, when the tide comes in, it's covered in salt water. Then the tide goes out, then it's bone dry. But it's Ireland, so it's going to rain. Now it's covered in fresh water, then it dries off again, tide comes in, cycle repeats. So salt water, fresh water, wet or dry, doesn't bother this plant. It's what made it really easy to store through the long winter months where it became a really, really important scent, um, source of vitamins, especially vitamin C. If you take the, the, boy, the lads out in Skellig Michael, um, the, the 12 monks who would have wintered there, the, um, the word Skellig translates from the Irish. It means shard or jagged rock. Very, very little grew out there, so their diet was quite poor. They had swapped, if you like, um, comfort for peace because it was so hard to get to on the edge of the known world. It was relatively free from um, invasions up until the ninth century when they, their most unwelcome international visitors arrived. They were the Norse Vikings who came to raid and kidnap and ransom. Um, they raised, raided there several times. But ironically, so the monks and Skelligs escaped scurvy by eating this plant every single day. So too did the Vikings. They carried the same plant on every single voyage. And that's what allowed them to voyage west as far as North America, um, east as far as Russia, south as far as the Mediterranean and to open up all those trade routes, which if you like, define my, um, European Irish um, history, but also European hist history by colonizing um, um, and populating cities, et cetera, et cetera. That's the plant, if you, if you like. Ireland's famous for um, shamrock and potatoes, 
But if you ask me, that's the plant that should be on our national flag. Dulisk or Dulisk, Dulishka, the leaf of the water. So that, that'll be one of my favorites. To the yeah. left of that, there's another one called kelp, uh, forest kelp. This forms a massive forest out, out in the ocean, so which is a, a, a tremendous habitat. Um, fish and shellfish, they live in it, they feed on it, they hide in it, they mate in it, they lay their eggs in it. But we must take it in context that microalgae and, and macroalgae, so microalgae are the tiny planktons that we can't see with the naked eye, macroalgae are the ones we can see. They um, produce 80% of the Earth's oxygen. So that um, kelp forest is incredible at um, sequestering carbons and releasing oxygen. Um, if you like, it's, it's the lungs of, of, of the Earth. So these kelp rods, they, have a very, they had a very interesting history. For about 100 years, they were collected and dried and then burnt. And what you got at the bottom of the pit was called potash. And potash was a huge, um, was worth a huge amount of money as a commodity. It was used in um, the linen industry, but also glass making, ceramics. But primarily, it was used to make gunpowder and explosives. So every war fought um, for around 100 years up to the end of the Napoleonic Wars was fought with potash made from kelp, gathered, dried and burnt in not just the coast of Ireland, but Scotland, um, Northern France, Norway, etc. Huge, huge, huge commodity. Then they discovered potash in a mine in um, Germany and the industry collapsed. However, during World War I, it was reinvented because the Allies couldn't buy potash from the Germans because they were at war with the Kaiser. So they started harvesting potash again, or harvesting kelp, excuse me, again, off San Diego, a place called Gunpowder Bay. And in three years, they destroyed the beds. That's over 100 years ago. And when I lived in Massachusetts um, in the late 80s, I knew some students who would go there on the, their gap year and they'd dive on the kelp beds to take away the urchins, which are the main grazing predator, and try and help the kelp beds recover. They still have not recovered over 100 years um, later. So in two and a half years, um, in, in the early 1900s, they wiped out the entire forest. So we've got to be very careful of how, how stuff is, it has to be harvested sustainably. What it's used for nowadays, it's used as a source of alginates and alginates are very important. Um, every firefighter's outfit, uh, the fibers are coated in alginates from the kelp. It's also used to make dental molds. But um, from a culinary point of view, it's used, and that's a piece of it dry. And this is the Asian stock cube. That's a piece of it dry right here. Um, and it's actually bleached in the sun. Um, and that's thrown into every soup, stew or casserole um, in Asia. And it's also the plant that released, releases umami or the fifth taste sensation of savoriness into the, into the dish. So we get, we, 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 um, we get umami from cooked tomatoes, from Parmesan cheese, from porcini mushrooms and from the kelps. So if you were to pop that into say spaghetti bolognese, which would be our kids favorite, it just brings the dish to a whole new level. The Asian stock cube. And um, funnily enough, this is a bleached piece. And um, so when it washes up in the storms, the sun bleaches it. It's also the only um, seaweed that the dogs, if you take the dogs to the beach, which we do all the time, this is the only seaweed they're attracted to. They eat this all the time, unprompted. Um, and it's quite, it, it, when we stand back and look at what's going on here, when this is bleached by the sun, it's essentially been cooked. So the giant complex proteins get cooked into, um, um, meaty amino acids, the giant complex sugars get broken down into simple sweet sugars. So if I hand you a parsnip and say I hand Bailey, no favoritism, a parsnip that's been in the oven for an hour, Bailey's delighted and David, you keep walking because there's nothing there for you. The same <laughs> thing has happened this piece of kelp. So it's quite remarkable. It's the only one the dogs um, eat at the shore, all dogs. Um, and it also happens to be the only plant known to man that contains all minerals and trace elements essential for a, ma a mammal's metabolism. So that's quite uncanny that this is the one the dogs go for. We're, we're, um, incidentally, we're gonna be bringing out a dog chew to the market made from this. <laughs> John, I'm just gonna step in just for the sake of time, but that was, that was so interesting to hear about. Um, one thing that struck me is just the beauty of where you live on the Ring of Kerry there. Um, can you just tell us a little bit what it's like to live there? I know you have a family there as well. Yeah, we've got two, Kerianne and I have two daughters, Ethel, who's almost seven, and Nora, who is six in a few weeks' time. Um, and even during lockdown, there's never a dull moment. We're cycling, we're going out in the kayak, we're going swimming. My wife still swims every day, um, even in the height of winter. 
I'm, I'm more a summer snorkeler myself. We also have a boat that goes out to the islands and catches um, fish out there. And we have one small net that we throw maybe two or three times a year for, for flatfish on the bottom. And um, you can snorkel and get scallops. Um, and as you can see where the ocean stops, the mountains begin. So we, we really are um, blessed. A very interesting part of the world, plagued by immigration, by famine, um, played a huge part in the wars of independence. Um, it was colonized, of course. Um, a lot of small farms, lots and lots of immigration. But now um, with, with uh, remote working and stuff, there's lots of innovative stuff going on and there's a whole new um, breath of life, if you like, to the place. Um, I, I just couldn't live in a city again. I did lots of cities and for me, this is going to be home forever. Fantastic. John, thanks so much for that. Um, I, uh, I think we may have a few questions for you as well. Stuff. Yes, uh, thank you again, John. That was so great. You really transported us right to the coast of Ireland. Um, so I just had uh, two questions I think that we have time for. So my first one I wanna ask you is, how long does this experience last in total? So when you're on tour, how long will you be um, on this excursion for? Sure, um, the, the actual stroll along the shore is approximately an hour. So I meet you guys at Derry and Anne House and Gardens, which is a, a, a museum run by the state, um, which has restrooms and parking and all that. We stroll down to the shore, we begin the tour, and then I walk you back to your coach. Um, and each, each um, guest, as well as walking the Wild Atlantic Way and grazing on it, they get a pair of postcards to take home with them with seaweed images. On the back is our website. You send us an email and we send you on a nutritional chart, um, an identification chart, and a synopsis of the tour. So you don't have to try and remember all this stuff because there's, there's lots of facts and some fiction yeah. and lots of tastings. <laughs> That's awesome. Super helpful too. Um, and so I have another question for you. What level of fitness do you need to have uh, for this specific experience? Um, just basically, if, if you can get up the steps into the hotel or you can climb in and out, out of the bus, um, you're, you're good to go with us. You bring a live raincoat because it's Ireland. Um, the, you don't need welly boots and um, you don't you don't need, even need walking boots a lot of people tend to do it barefoot and um, i do myself in the height of the summer and um, but just just sensible walking shoes no heels is the rule men, men or women no heels right you might sink <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't be a good end um well i think that's all the time we have for questions john and i really want to say thank you on behalf of all of us uh for joining us today and sharing your expertise it was sure. so much fun. atlantic irish seaweed is our website if anybody wants to take a look at that <laughs> or hopefully we'll get to see you um with go ahead in 2022 it can't come fast enough guys stay safe and be nice to each other <laughs> thank you john we really appreciate it take so care now <laughs> So now that we've learned the many ways that seaweed can be used, um, I want to talk to you guys about how to get active on our tours. So Lael, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bailey. Um, wow, learned a lot about seaweed for sure. So next, we're going to talk about our small group adventure tours. Uh, according to Adventure Travel Trade Association, adventure travel may be any activity including two of the following three components, a physical activity, a cultural exchange or interaction, and engagement with nature. While the definition of adventure tourism only requires two of these components, we incorporate all three on our small group adventure tours to give our travelers the fullest travel experience. Let's talk about a few of these adventure experiences that make these tours so special and memorable. So we'll start with the Path of the Gods uh, in the Malfi Coast in Italy. The Path of Gods is truly uh, truly does his name justice. It's an incredible, incredible hike. You walk along an ancient uh, route used by merchants and locals for centuries. You walk past terrace farms, isolated villages with panoramas of the coast around every corner. With sweeping epic views of Malfi Coast from thousands of feet above, this is a once in a lifetime kind of hike. Lil, I want to jump in really quickly here um, because I had heard of the Path of the Gods, but I never really known much about it until we were discussing it for this session. So I want to test the audience. So a poll should pop up for you here. If uh, you're on Facebook, go ahead. Like we said earlier, comment. Do you know how long the Path of the Gods is? Is it 11 miles, 4, 6.5, or 15 miles? So go ahead and submit those answers. And like I said, comment if you're on Facebook. Let's see. So majority of people are saying 6.5 miles. 
a few more saying four miles. We'll have to see who's right. <laughs> All right. Give it a few more seconds here. Great. So it looks like the majority of you said 6.5 miles. Now you were really close because the answer is four miles or 6.5 kilometers. So just by a little bit were you wrong, but that's all right. Um, and hey, four miles, I think I could manage that on a on a good day. <laughs> did you hike the whole path, Lail? Uh, I did, Bailey. And actually, for those who voted six and a half miles, you're not totally wrong because there are ways to extend the path to actually get to six and a half miles. Um, but I did it a few years ago on my honeymoon. Um, and my wife and I hiked the entire path from Priano to Positano on the Mount Mount the Coast. It was, it was incredible. So next up, I want to talk about um, Dracol Sutherland. Um, this is one of Iceland's natural crown jewels. In Icelandic, the translation just means glaciers, river, or lagoon. And that picture says just that. You're board a small zodiac boat and cruise out amongst the icebergs to see the mouth of the large glacier. Iceland is covered in glaciers, but not many of them extend all the way down to the sea. Your local naturalist guide in the zodiac boat will teach you about glaciology and how glaciers have shaped the landscape of Iceland, as well as, well as point out the abundance of marine wildlife like seals and also bird life like Arctic terns. I also want to highlight Miz the Mismanai community in the Sacred Valley. I had the honor of, of visiting this community about five years ago and it's an incredible experience. The community is perched up on a hill overlooking the Sacred Valley of the Incas with panoramic views of the Andes. The community will welcome you um, and talk about their ancestral traditions that have really been handed down from the Incas. Um, anything from how they farm, uh, potatoes and other vegetables along terrace slopes. They'll also give you a tasting of chicha, which is actually a fermented potato beer. They'll also show you their textiles and traditional weaving practices. Um, do a, a Andy, uh, Andean music performance and then welcome you to a home hosted lunch outside. It's a really incredible uh, experience that gives you an in-depth look at their traditions and culture. I'm also excited to announce uh, we have nine new small group adventure tours that are now available on our website starting this week as well as next. I'm going to talk uh, about a few of these new tours that are going live. So first is a Thailand adventure, um, Bangkok, Chiang Mai, and the islands. So this combines both incredible north as well as uh, the, the Thai islands. A few highlight experiences I just want to talk about is one, a visit to a sustainable elephant sanctuary outside Chiang Mai. Um, you observe the elephants um, navigate the lush for forest and also learn about the surrounding communities, uh, especially the Karen Hill tribe culture. We also give a chance to interact with a, a Buddhist monk at, at a monastery in Chiang Mai, where the monk will talk about the tenets and principles of Buddhism and what, it, what it's like to actually be a monk. Um, and then finally, a speedboat cruise uh, through Phang Ga Bay National Park in, down in southern Thailand uh, to visit James Bond Island in, lo in a local fishing village on stilts. It's a really incredible experience. I also want to talk about our new Israel Adventure Tour. Uh, so this has some amazing experiences, anything from a Jeep safari through the Golan Heights with a wine tasting to floating in the Dead Sea. Uh, the Dead Sea has incredibly high salinity and you're just kind of float right on top without barely having to swim. Also give a chance to hike um, up to the ancient fortress of Masada at sunrise that looks over the Judean desert and the Dead Sea. And then finally, a chance to interact with local culture through a home hosted Shabbat dinner on Friday night in Jerusalem. And then next, we also have some new adventure options in the US and Canada, a little bit closer home. One exciting new tour takes you to the scenic Canadian Rockies. One highlight day that I love on this new tour is a hike that takes you up to Fairview viewpoint overlooking Lake Louise. For anyone who hasn't been to Lake Louise, it's incredibly beautiful with this turquoise glacier fed lake ringed by high peaks. Pretty amazing. The third and final small group travel style that I wanna talk about today is our safari and wildlife tours. While smaller group safari and wildlife tours provide a chance to immerse yourself in a destination's natural beauty, while also viewing wildlife and interacting with local communities, and also about learning um, about conservation efforts with lo expert local guides. These tours bring you to destinations like Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, and Botswana in Africa, but also to countries like Panama and Costa Rica, 
and also our great US state of Alaska. So let's dive into a few of my favorite experiences on our uh, small group safari and wildlife tours. One is a game drive in Amboseli National Park. Amboseli is one of the most beautiful national parks in all of Africa. It's located close to the border uh, of Tanzania and Kenya. I think the most dominant part of the park is, is actually the views of Mount Kilimanjaro. So Mount Kilimanjaro is right over the border in Tanzania, but it stands almost 20,000 feet uh, in the tropics. And it's actually, it's covered in snow, which is pretty amazing. Um, so anywhere you go in the park, you'll see, uh, you'll see the mountain. And sometimes it's covering clouds, but oftentimes the cloud cover is actually sits right, right mid-mountain where you can see the top, you can see below, but you can't see the whole thing. Um, but we offer game drives through plains and wetlands to see large herds of elephants, giraffes, hippos, monkeys, all types of African savanna wildlife. This is actually one of the best places in Kenya to see large herds of African element, uh, elephants. Um, also in the park, we engage with actually a local NG, NGO that provides a talk about uh, their anti-poaching initiatives and how they work with the local Maasai people to stop poachers and support conservation. It's pretty incredible. Lael, I do want to jump in here. We got a question from the crowd uh, and they're wondering what kind of vehicle do you use for a safari trip? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so in East Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania, we use uh, four by four land cruisers, uh, which are great. Um, in South Africa, it'll depend. Um, so when you're traveling between places, you go by bus when you're actually on the safaris. In South, Southern Africa, uh, they tend to use more of the open air vehicles. So, uh, but all four by fours. That's great, thank you so much. Um, so I highly suggest our Kenya Wildlife and Safari Tour. I actually did it back in 2019 and it was an absolute dream. Um, so before we move on, I actually wanna ask you another trivia question. So do you know where the Great Migration circulates in Tan uh, Tanzania and Kenya? So this should pull up for you again, Facebook, for free, uh, feel free to comment. So is it Kruger National Park in Masai Mara? Lake Nakuru National Park and the Serengeti, the Serengeti and Kruger National Park, or the Masai Mara and the Serengeti. So let's see what answers we have. Okay, so it looks like a pretty even tie right now between Serengeti and Kruger or Masai Mara and Serengeti. So we'll give you a few more seconds to answer and see who will be right. So close between those two. Wow, so we had even 42% of uh, you guys who answered Serengeti and Kruger National Park and then Masai Mara and the Serengeti. So the right answer is actually Masai Mara and the Serengeti. So great job to everybody, but I do wanna hear about another unique safari experience. Can you tell us about that, Lael? Yep, uh, so safaris don't just have to be done by four by four vehicles. I think that's often people's vision of what a safari is all about but they can also be done by other unique transportation. Uh, so in Botswana, in the Okavanga Delta, uh, which is actually one of the Africa's greatest and most pristine wilderness areas, we offer a motorized Makoro canoe safari led by a naturalist guide. You'll leave actually directly from the lodge by boat and you'll get to view incredible bird life um, and animals, so, you know, such as hippos, frogs, um, deer, and much more. Um, really, there's nothing quite as serene as floating through the flo flooded Okavanga by boat and spotting wildlife. It's a pretty, another incredible experience. I also want to talk about um, Chimp Eden, um, which is a, an organization and conservation area that we visit in South Africa. Uh, so Chimp Eden is also known as the Jane Goodall Institute of South Africa, and it's located right outside of Kruger National Park. Uh, so for any, any of you not familiar with Jane Goodall, uh, she's an English primatologist and anthropologist who's pioneered research into chimpanzee behaviors and has become really the leading advocate for conservation and preservation of this endangered species. Chimps are currently listed as, as endangered and many fear that they might go extinct in the coming decades. Um, Chimp Eden is a rescue and rehabilitation center for these chimps uh, that have survived the, the, either the bush meat trade or, or orphaned or rescued from, from the illegal pet and entertainment trade. Uh, this is an incredible ex experience to view and learn about chimps at the Institute. Uh, chimps are also the closest, um, closest hum to humans in terms of the animal kingdom. And it's fascinating to observe their behaviors and interactions. 
Great, thank you so much, Lael. Um, and thank you, David, as well, for sharing these experiences that many can have on our small group tours. So I wanna ask the crowd, which one of these experiences appeals most to you? So we had the Women's Association of Crete, the cooking class near Bologna, Atlantic Irish Seaweed, Path of the Gods, the Glacier Lagoon by Zodiac, the Missimini Community, the Game Drives at Ambicelli, the Okavango Delta Canoe Safari, and then the Jane Goodall Institute of South Africa. So go ahead and get those answers in. I'm curious to see which one everyone uh, is most excited about. Let's see. So we have a lot of people who are interested in Path of the Gods and the cooking class, both great choices. And we'll give you a few more seconds here to get your answers in. Oh, and the game drives in Ambicelli are making a little bit of a comeback here. Let's see. All right, so the overall winner is our Path of the Gods. And I would agree with you guys. I'm really excited about that and I have it on my bucket list. So that'll be next for me. Um, and I do wanna pivot a bit here actually. So I know that with these smaller group tours, we're able to reserve hotels we wouldn't normally be able to. And David, can you tell us more about those unique accommodations? Sure, I mean, a, a hotel is, is an important part of any tour experience. Um, but with the small group um, portfolios that we have, we are able to work with properties that just wouldn't work for, for larger groups. Um, so whether this is sort of agro-turismo, farm stays, or eco-lodges, or tented camps, or historic hotels, or boutique hotels, still with a go-ahead quality, but each one different. Um, we still prioritize hotels that are eco-friendly um, and have sustainable practices, and we include where, where we can um, portage as well. But I wanted to take a quick look at some of the hotels that we're working with across the world. Uh, so first of all, let me take you to Aberdare National Park in Kenya. Um, the, uh, the hotel we work with there is actually called the, uh, the Ark. Um, and when you see the building, it's for, it's for fairly obvious reasons. It's an incredible um, hotel that we work with, right, located right on the edge of a waterhole as well. Uh, so, it, of course, it's a natural place for all of the animals to come and, and drink and bathe and so on. And there's various different platforms on the hotel that you can see the animals from, uh, from the restaurant and, and from the viewing platforms and also from some of the rooms as well. It's incredible. Um, and even the night guard will buzz your room to let you know in the night if there is a particular animal that has arrived at the, at the water spot um, for you to, to see. So really incredible. I want to talk also about eco lodge hotels as well, because these feature highly on many of our itineraries in the more tropical climates. Um, and uh, these particular lodges are from uh, Costa Rica. Um, and if you've not stayed in an eco lodge before, you really have to, because um, they're often quite rustic. Um, they blend in with the with the local environment as they're often made from local materials. Um, and they really aim to have as low an impact on the local environment as possible. So. You know, normally hotels are awarded stars. Well, in Costa Rica, these eco lodges are actually awarded leaves. So the more leaves that they have, the more uh, sort of uh, credentials they have when it comes to um, sustainability. Um, so they keep an eye on things like uh, energy consumption and pollution and, and waste um, and where they source their food from. And for example, there may not be air conditioning, but there may be a, feel a ceiling fan um, instead. Um, but generally, eco lodges are just an amazing way to really get close to uh, to nature and to the animals. If we move now to Europe, um, many of our small group tours also feature the opportunity to stay in an incredible uh, farm location as well. Um, whether it's a, amongst a, a farm, an agricultural farm, or a vineyard, or in the countryside with stunning views. And so we work with many types of property. Uh, we work with agriturismi, which I'm sure you've heard of before, and masarias and, and fincas. Uh, just to name, you know, some of the properties that, that we, we work with. In Agroturismo, you're staying in accommodation on a farm and the food that you're eating is produced uh, mainly from that farm. And again, they pride themselves on that farm to table uh, concept as well and produce uh, the food in a very sustainable way. And Masseria is actually unique to Puglia, um, which is a region in the south of Italy. Um, often there is a fortified farmhouse that sort of defines the Masseria as well, um, and uh, were built in around the 16th century in a very similar concept to uh, an agriturismo. Um, I then 
Uh, and then, of course, we have the thinkers in Spain as well. So in, 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 uh, in Spain, the, the version of, a, of an agriturismo is, is more of a thinker. So it's accommodation combined with um, some kind of small holding or farm. But I want to move on to talking about boutique hotels as well, because we do feature a lot of boutique properties on our small group tour portfolio as well. Um, and the particular one we're highlighting here is a view of uh, the Acropolis, incredible view from the restaurant, but also from uh, the swimming pool and many of the uh, hotel rooms as well. This is the St. George Licabetas Hotel. It's a five star hotel that we've worked with for many years. Um, and of course, it has all the amenities you'd expect uh, of a five star hotel, but it also has that very unique local flavor um, as well. Um, and so with our small group tours, you know, we do work with a lot of boutique hotels because because of the smaller group sizes that we have. Um, and so, you know, staying in a boutique hotel is definitely a highlight of the small group tour experience. David, I want to jump in here quickly because we did get a question uh, about hotels for our small group tours from the audience. And Larry asks, how do you choose hotels at Go Ahead? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have a a team, as I mentioned, in Zurich that are traveling to all of the destinations within Europe we go to. But we also have a network of offices across uh, EF, um, and we always have local people. We always have local offices. So we always have our finger on the pulse of what's happening in every destination uh, and are able to really uh, ensure that we're working with the very best properties uh, around the world. And of course, our tour director community as well. We have this very large and fantastic tour director community. And again, they're helping us as well in terms of identifying new opportunities in these destinations. That's great, David. Thank you so much for clarifying. Now, I do wanna shift it back to Lael to talk about our commitment to responsible tourism. Great, thanks, Bailey. So I wanna talk a little bit about our small group uh, tours, responsible travel principles. Um, at EF Go Ahead Tours, we believe that travel should help make the, the world better. Travel is a powerful way to foster understanding of and respect for the people, cultures, and place of the world. Ultimately, travel can change the way we think, feel, and act, and therefore has a power to affect tremendous change throughout the globe. I'm sure all of you agree if you've traveled. When you explore the world with Go Ahead Tours, know that we seek to benefit the world, now and also for years to come. Our small group responsible travel initiatives focus on three specific commitments and focus areas. Each commitment helps us work towards this more sustainable world and helps fulfill our mission of opening the world through learning. So we'll start with our impact on, uh, on uh, com local communities. This is about supporting small uh, and local businesses and livelihoods. It's about seeking out suppliers with cooperative structures. It's actively incorporating diverse populations and ensuring representative voices. It's also ensuring tourism activities that help sustain and prom promote the traditional ways of life throughout the world. Also, um, we're focusing on our impact on the environment. Uh, this is about sourcing suppliers with robust uh, environmental programs, even if it's not the focus of the experience. Uh, it's also about introducing experiences that get people out in nature and proactively incorporating lessons of sustainability, traditional land use, conservation, and the protection of iconic sites. And then finally, it's all about impact on animal welfare. Uh, we partnered with the World Animal Protection Organization uh, a couple of years ago, have really helped shape our approach to animal welfare and tour. Our small group tours have introduced a lot of new content with animal welfare in mind that make a positive impact on habitat conservation, animal rescue and rehabilitation, as well as anti-poaching initi initiatives. With that, I thank you. And um, I'm gonna hand it back to Debele. Great, thank you, Lael, for sharing all of that information. Uh, we learned so much today, and personally, I am so excited about these destinations and travel styles. Is everyone else excited? Let's hear it in the chat box, right? Great destinations, unique experiences. What more could we ask for? So exciting. Um, but let's move on to the q and I'm sure we have some questions we wanna get to for these two hosts. So let's see. Um, first, I do wanna direct a question to David. Um, Linda asks, are these tours suitable for solo travel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the answer to that is absolutely. Um, I think the, the smaller group uh, as well is ideal for people who are, are traveling um, solo, um, but really, and it offers an opportunity to sort of build community on these, on these um, smaller tours as well. Um, but traveling on any tour that we have at Go Ahead, you know, we're taking care of all of the arrangements too, if you're a solo traveler, 
uh, for anyone on our tours. And we have a strong focus on, on safety as well. We have a dedicated safety and incident response uh, team too that oversees all of our safety globally. So I would say the short answer is yes, absolutely, Bailey, to that question. Yeah, and just to jump in and expand on, on what David was saying, you know, a lot of these small group tours get you to destinations or have themes that are really hard to do on your, on your own. Um, so if you're looking to do this type of trip, you know, traveling with us, especially solo, it really gives you the benefits of that support and expertise and safety and security. That's a great point, Lyle, um, and, and thank you for telling us that. So I do have a question for you too, while I have you. From Vivian, what's the age group on these tours? Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, with Go Ahead Tours, and we have a mix of ages, uh, but I would say our, our small group tours are really great for, again, a mix of different ages. Any, anything from, you know, if you're in your 30s all the way up until your, your 70s. I, for me, these trips are all about a state of mind. Um, it's about, you know, wanting to learn more. It's about immersing more with, with local destinations. It's about kind of that sense of adventure and being kind of an intrepid traveler. Um, you know, a lot of the experiences do require some mobility, uh, but you don't have to be in incredible shape, shape to do these. A lot of even the most strenuous days um, or activities, you can opt in through optional excursions. That's great. Thank you, Lyle. Um, and I do have another question for you. So are smoop, uh, small group tours obvious on our website as opposed to the classic tours? Where can they find them? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so we, we actually now have a small group uh, landing page that talks about all of our small group tours. Um, so you can find it through, through those. You can also search for small group tours right in the search bar. You can also look at any of the individual travel styles that I mentioned, um, such as food and wine, adventure, or safari and wildlife. Uh, and we're also working on making these trips even more clear. Um, but also if you're on any itinerary page and you see actually the tour capacity, it will say 10 to 22 travelers as well. Uh, but right Great. now we have about 40, 40 plus itineraries uh, that are in our small group uh, collection. Um, and as I mentioned, 13 of those are, are actually brand new that are launched, launching this week and next. That's great, Lil, thank you. It's super exciting too. Um, and I do have one last question for the both of you. So of all of the tours that we're launching or have for small group tours, which one are you most excited about? And whoever wants to, to tackle that first, go for it. Well, I'm gonna jump in first, Lyle, I'm sorry. Um, my favorite uh, uh, tour in this portfolio has to be the food tour, the new food tour of Ireland that we were talking about earlier. Um, I mean, it was a pleasure talking with John there earlier, um, but it's really, I think it offers something so different. Oops, I think we lost you there for a second, David. Can you hear us? Lil, can, if you want to jump in and share yeah, your Sure, I can jump in. I mean, I was almost going to say the same thing as him. So we were, we were on the same page with the culinary tour of Ireland, but I can definitely choose, choose something different as well. Um, I mean, there are so many incredible itineraries to choose from, um, you know, both in the new itineraries, but all, also the ones we already offer. Uh, one of my favorite trips I already, already offer that's in the small group portfolio is actually a tour that combines Greece um, and then and the Balkans. So it goes to Greece, it goes to North Macedonia, it goes to Albania, it goes to Montenegro and Croatia. And it's really incredible, a part of Europe. So it's a, it's a tour that I highly, highly recommend. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Um, definitely on my list, but I think that's all we have time for today. And thank you so much, Lael. Um, and David, I'm not sure if he's still here, but you guys did an excellent job talking to us about this. And I know I learned a ton and hoping that everyone else here did as well. Now, if you enjoyed your time here, we'd love to have you join us for our future travel talks. We have another destination spotlight happening this coming Tuesday, February 16th. Uh, it's, we're gonna be talking about Australia and New Zealand. So we'd love to have you there. And then we're gonna be bringing St. Patrick's Day right to your living room on March 16th with a destination spotlight of Ireland. So if you don't wanna miss either of these, be sure to register on our website and feel free to share it with your friends, family, or on social media. We would love to have 
everyone come and join us, the more the merrier. And I do just wanna give one last thank you to everyone. We'll be sending a follow-up email with a short survey. So please fill this out if you can. We'd love to hear your feedback. And again, thank you to Lael, David, and our special guest, John. We appreciate you taking the time to talk all things small group tours. Um, any parting words from you guys? Um, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I could have talked with all of you for the next six hours or the next three days straight. If you keep me going, it's hard to shut me up. Um, but uh, we really hope to see you uh, on one of these small group tours in the future. Uh, they're incredible, incredible experiences. It's something that I'm really passionate about and it's been inspirational putting these together. Yeah, I'd just add to that, Lael. I mean, I've worked on so many of these tours, but again, particularly the food and wine for me, and I'm sure I'll probably see bump into you on one of those tours at some point soon. Great. Thanks again, Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.